Acting Director Cuccinelli, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. So, Director, one of the things that's getting a lot of comments this morning is your uh, statement about the Statue of Liberty. They, you've been accused of distorting it, of undermining its message. I want to give you a chance to explain what you meant by that whenever you said that you should be able to come to America and stand on your own two feet. That's right. The public charge rule that we are talking about is about self-sufficiency. Um, and in federal law, it goes back, uh, you know, 140 years but you'll find public charge laws on the books all the way into the colonial era. So this is, a, this is a part and parcel of America's immigration history. We want people to come here. We're the most generous nation in the history of the world when it comes to immigration and having open arms, but we do expect people to stand on their own two feet to care for themselves, not to come here and be what has historically been called a public charge mm -hmm. or a burden on the people or the government. And particularly in the modern era of the modern welfare state, that is an expensive burden indeed. So this rule gives our immigration services officers, ISOs as we call them, uh, the tools and guidelines to start to make these decisions effectively. It hasn't changed the law. We don't do that with regulations. We're implementing a bipartisan law passed in 1996 uh, that really just continued the long history of requiring new, newly arrived immigrants to this country uh, to be able to stand on their own. I should say, this excludes asylees, it excludes right. refugees, all the humanitarian categories, domestic violence victims, uh, human trafficking victims, all those categories are excluded. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the objection that I've seen mostly is people say, if these rules had been in place, then my parents, my grandparents, my ancestors, or whomever, would not have been able to come to the United States. What, what would your response well, to that? Well, I got news for you. Yeah. Rules like this were in place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the nature of what was needed and what skills it took to be self-sufficient changes over time. Um, however, we've had these public charge requirements on the federal law, as I said, yep. since the late 1800s, and they long predate the plaque on the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, the Statue of Liberty is, is the thing that has, I think, captured the public imagination uh, under this. What is the purpose of immigration in your view? That's an excellent yeah. question. The purpose of immigration uh, for America is to benefit America. That's first and foremost. What we offered everyone to come here is a privilege for them. No one has a right to any of the benefits that we offer to non-citizens. Um, and that's part of why I say America has been so generous because those benefits have been offered expansively throughout our history. They're being offered expansively today. But one thing that stays consistent throughout our history is that they are offered to people to come and, and uh, take advantage of opportunities, not guarantees. And that means they have to be self-sufficient. So uh, one of the uh, responses I've seen to this is that if Congress did not specifically enumerate that public charge cannot be to be used to deny immigration, that it can be challenged in the federal court system. Are you preparing for court challenges on this basis? Well, th this is a regulation well within the boundaries of the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, people say they're going to sue over everything this president does, and here he is keeping another promise in the immigration space, so you can fully expect people who have read, oh, 10 percent, 5 percent, none mm -hmm. of the yeah, rule, sure. come out and say they're going to sue. Um, as I used to tell my defense clients, God bless America, anybody can sue you for anything. <laughs> it just doesn't mean they get to win. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're a very solid legal foundation here, and the history just backs us up. So President Trump, and uh, he has promised to restrict legal immigration from the very beginning. Why did it take almost two and a half years into his office to enact a regulation like this? Well, I, I wouldn't say yeah. what we're doing uh, in the Trump administration is restricting legal immigration. We swore in more American citizens yeah. last year than the four years before that. Is that a victory? Well, I mean, it certainly shows that we're working hard and effectively and efficiently, and okay. we're not getting in people's way mm -hmm. who are obeying the law and following the rules that we've set up over the years. We're going to see a similar number of new citizens this year as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all of these things go on at the same time. We fight illegal immigration while we process legal immigration. Yeah, and and uh, this is a an element now of that process that will take place when people seek a green card to become legal permanent residents with USCIS. So are we, do we expect to see the exact same number of green cards and number of legal immigrants admitted as US citizens after the rule as opposed to before the rule? Well, 
part of the problem with answering that is we don't know how many people will come or go at any given time. Sure. Uh, but we do expect this rule to matter. It is going to have an effect. Uh, for USCIS, the agency I lead within the Department of Homeland Security, we're in the range of about 400,000 applicants for green cards in the last full year, as I recall. And so those 400,000 people will be the ones that our officers, career uh, immigration services officers, will be subjecting to mm. this analysis. And, um, and of course, every piece of this, we focus so much on the receipt of welfare, but the reality is the receipt of welfare is only one factor. If someone receives welfare, receives the particular benefits that we identify specifically in the rule for more than 12 months out of 36 or think that they may in the future, that is a heavily weighted negative factor, but it is only one factor. Mm -hmm. Our career ISOs, as we call them, will decide the entire case for that applicant based on all of the factors. And what Congress told us we have to consider is age, health, financial status and resources, education and skills and family status. Those are all in the statute. So all we're doing here is implementing the law. Uh, 20 years ago, INS, before the Department of Homeland Security existed, issued some guidance and said a rule is coming. Well, <laughs> they never put out a rule. And uh, so we have fulfilled that here uh, this week. I see. One of the things that your predecessor clashed with the White House on was implementation of this rule. And it's not just this, it was on asylum as well. How have you sped up the president's directives in order to forcefully act on immigration under your tenure so far in the last month? Well, I can only speak to my time here. I, I'm not in a great sure. position to compare before that. Um, but I am, you know, I have a regulatory history both as an AG reviewing regs in a state process and being part of the litigation process as well. So I've been in many different parts of this, um, this process. And uh, so I have, I come in with some expertise in the regulatory environment. I've dug in myself to that, those processes and have made my own adjustments uh, and worked with the other partners we have. DHS headquarters is obviously critical for us, mm -hmm. um, as well as working with the White House to try to move things along as quickly as we can within the constraints of manpower and yeah. time. And one of those things that you're moving to imp uh, implement quickly was I, there was some discussion about the role of the USCIS officer in the initial interview of an asylum seeker. Now this matters a lot because it was depending on the amount of scrutiny. Now you've asked these officers to increase the scrutiny because you say many of these claims are fraudulent. Have we seen that increase in scrutiny under your tenure? I wouldn't characterize mm -hmm. what I've done as say be more, you know, apply more serious sure. scrutiny. I have pointed out to our immigration officers uh, the extraordinary gap in the asylum space in particular of the people claiming credible fear uh, in that process and those ultimately getting asylum. It's, it's almost an eight to one, seven to one ratio. And the number of people who get through the initial credible fear screen but are not legitimate asylum seekers clog up the process for the legitimate mm. asylum seekers. So have we seen the increase in these officers acting with better discretion? Uh, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we have any data seeing okay. any, any change in the course of their mm. decision making. One of the things as a new director I've done is draw their attention to resources. We have seen historically, before I arrived here, uh, the impact on decision making of more granular country information that we get from the State Department and training our people on that. When they know that the people coming before them have alternatives, that affects how that analysis takes mm. place. So I hope that we're getting all that information out more thoroughly absorbed into the ranks of uh, the, you know, we have almost 20,000 people working at USCIS, uh, almost 2,000 in the uh, asylum arena alone. And uh, so we have a lot of people to, to work with. Absolutely. What about work permits? And one of the other issues here was about work permits granted to asylum seekers while they're in the midst of their process. There's a criticism of that, that it's just an incentivization of drawing more illegal immigration to the United States. Have you taken action on that front? Well, certainly yeah. uh, the work permit 
whether it's for asylees or others, is uh, critical from their perspective to a motivation to come here. Mm -hmm. So uh, the rules haven't changed on this since I've arrived. Will uh, they? But, well, I mean, I'm yeah. analyzing. I'm mm. in my third month now, and, and I'm on a steep learning curve. I like yeah. learning, yeah. Uh, which is good here. <laughs> but analyzing this data is one of the things that we're doing internally. Um, and we're coordinating with the other elements of DHS mm. as we contemplate what steps are available to us because we always, of course, have to stay within the law. Mm -hmm. Does the number of asylum seekers hinder the United States' ability to accept uh, actual refugees, le legitimate refugees from around Well, the they're world. both in the same, yeah. uh, they're under the same humanitarian umbrella. Mm. And um, other countries use these words a little differently than we do. But uh, for myself as the person responsible for the agency that processes all of them, I view them in a pool. And um, uh, for instance, refugee officers and asylum officers can do each other's jobs um, with uh, often with no additional training because they're already cross-trained. So, so we view them in one pool in the leadership here and, uh, and we're of course str struggling with the asylum backlog while I would say we're on top of the refugee flow which is much smaller than the asylum flow. Hmm. Well, I think Flood, I yeah. should say. Sure. Uh, well, <laughs> what actions, and have we seen a legitimate drop in the number of asylum seekers since that you've taken office? Not necessarily with this, but with Remain in Mexico and all of that. This is a top priority for many of the supporters for the president. Well, I certainly think yeah. we have seen the numbers coming across the southern border dropping, and, uh, and that is important. That work was ongoing before I got here, and it's largely the result of the president's interaction with Mexico first. We're getting more cooperation from them than we've ever had in this area. And then, of course, the possibility of extending that cooperation to Guatemala and hopefully others mm -hmm. in Central America. That's really what's driving the numbers down from that incredible peak in May down to below 100,000, 82,000 in the most recent month of July, still a crisis level, yeah. and all this without congressional help which is really what's needed for permanent long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. Then uh, w what do you make of the current moment versus, uh, there's a lot of discussion about, like we talked about this earlier, the role of immigration, what is the purpose of immigration. People say that we should have the exact same immigration policies we did in 1882 because of, of it would fit a moral equivalent to 2019. What would your response to that be? Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think we just <laughs> do the yeah. same thing from 140 years ago. Uh, because we did it 140 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, the things we keep from 140 years ago are because they're good policy, things like public charge requirement. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it goes back even farther than that. Um, but I don't believe that other than getting congressional help, there are too many more tools left to us to keep driving the numbers down. Um, we are just enforcing the laws on the books um, and trying to find ways to do that more and more effectively. I, w I have to note that we would be a lot farther down the road if this president hadn't suffered from an, a historic invasion of the separation of powers by the courts, by a number of activist judges who have issued more nationwide injunctions against this president's policies than I don't even know how many presidents combined before him, um, but it's more than one. <laughs> and we're at the two and a half year mark. So uh, that has been uh, just a historic challenge for this administration, uh, despite the fact that when, when the lawsuits go up through the process, the president wins. He, they're, they're working within the law and they're winning these cases, but it takes a long, takes a long time, time to go through that yeah. process. So then the final question for you here is, what are the other things that you are reviewing in order to reduce the flow across the southern border? We talked about work per permits. What are some other things that you've identified, at least on the preliminary level, that could reduce the, uh, the asylum and uh, draw from Guatemala and the Northern Triangle? Sure. Well, we, we're continually looking with our DHS partners at steps we can take to make the whole credible fear and reasonable fear analysis that we do faster and smoother for the Remain in Mexico program, which has been so successful, as well as to make the asylum system more efficient, frankly, and more effective. Mm -hmm. Those are steps that are within USCIS control. Uh, we obviously partner with Border Patrol and ICE 
in all of these efforts uh, across the agencies. Um, but those are main focuses for us. And as you and I discussed, there are other areas we're at least looking at of what other options we have. We issued an asylum rule several weeks ago and uh, in about a week and a half, despite a judge in Washington saying uh, it's legitimate enough at least not to be enjoined, then a judge in California nullifies that ruling by issuing a nationwide injunction against that asylum rule. If that rule had been allowed to be put in place, by now you and I would be talking and I'd have an answer to your question mm -hmm. that included lower numbers going down, but we don't see that because um, this particular judge and others um, make similar rulings to essentially get in the way of perfectly legal policy. Well, Acting Director Cuccinelli, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Good to be with you.